Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan, and I'm really excited about this episode. With us today are Christopher Wood and Ashwin Vishwanathan. Christopher Wood is the Managing Director, Center for Avian Population Studies, and the Director of eBird. Ashwin Vishwanathan is at the Nature Conservation Foundation, where he is a research associate in the Education and Public Engagement Division. He is also a part of Bird Count India. which encourages bird watching using ebird as a tool welcome chris and welcome ashwin thank you for being with us thank you thank you so um everybody here that i know uses ebird so we were really excited to talk to you um uh, chris maybe you can kick it off by saying approximately what's the size of the data that is collected through ebird globally and maybe ashwin can weigh in about india Yes, yeah, so globally now we're right about at the point where we'll reach our 1 billionth record billionth with a b. Um we think that'll happen sort of around the 4th or 5th of of May depending how how checklists come in. So that's um you know that's very exciting for us. And in India, uh what is the size of the data Ashwin or bro- so, broadly So to provide some context in India uh ebird started being used only in 2014 in india mm-hmm. and uh, since then the growth has been phenomenal and um, across the country we've been realizing that it's a it's really a fantastic tool to monitor our birds and uh, now um, we have about 24 million observations from india and uh, that's uh, over 1.5 million checklists and 24000 bird watchers so that's um, quite a phenomenal number at least given that we started less than 10 years back uh, all species uh, ever recorded in india are now on ebird and every new species that's the first platform which uh, actually has it and aside from that uh, the photographs and i think we just crossed a million photographs from india on the macaulay library associated with ebird so uh, that was quite exciting for us Um Chris which are some countries that have been with eBird for a while besides the US of course but uh, other uh, so uh, Ashwin said 2014 for India which are some of the older and the younger countries Yeah that's a great question Shobha and you know we started and we were really focused on the US and Canada we had the idea that um you know, this is 20 years ago that there are bird watchers around the around the world but we were thinking about the US and Canada who were keeping notebooks and if there was some way to get everybody to to enter their data from those notebooks into a database we could do some really cool science and ultimately conservation with that um and and it was really focused there and then we were approached by um Humberto Berlanga in Mexico who works for Canabio and he said you know this is a this is a pretty cool platform we'd really like to be able to develop something similar in Mexico and integrate it with what you're doing so that we can you know take advantage of using the same system and and pooling resources into one thing where we can all work collaboratively to make it better and so Mexico is the the first country after um the US and Canada and I think it's really cool that the idea to sort of expand this was driven from Mexico um and then it was really the excitement of of the birding community globally wanting to to take part in something which has been really important to us it's um it's really part of our philosophy that we try to listen and understand where ebird can fit into systems um and and help the conservation community the scientific community in those places as opposed to something that we um you know would impose on on to different places because birders are famously recalcitrant recalcitrant against any sort of imposition exactly uh, and i think right rightfully so and um you know we spend a lot of time just trying to listen for some common themes about what people would like and you know i have the advantage of being a pretty dedicated bird watcher before we we met today i went out and walked around the the place that i was staying and saw some roseate spoonbills and lots of egrets and the first black and white warbler that i've recorded right here so you know i think a, a little bit about you know what's interesting for me and then i have these great conversations with you know people like ashwin and umberto from around the world and we sort of just talk about some of the things that would be fun for us to develop and then we you know talk to a team of application developers about what's possible 
And then ultimately thinking about sort of what does the conservation community really need in terms of how the data are formatted. And what that's allowed is, you know, we, we, we started the U.S. and Canada, then went, went to Mexico, and then fairly quickly we, we got a lot of interest from Latin America, so we expanded the program throughout the Americas, and then basically opened up the ability for people to, um, to take part globally. And when we've done that, you know, for, to a large extent, we've sort of waited and listened and, and tried to understand where there's interest in people um, engaging, with, engaging with the platform. And I think India is a, a great example of how that's taken place. Ashwin, can you elaborate on that? Were you with eBird? I mean, were you with Bird Count India from 2014? And what was the ramp up with respect to India? How quickly did we did bird watchers adapt to eBird? So I haven't been with Bird Count India since 2014. I was a plant ecologist back then. And uh, but um, I've been using eBird from the beginning simply because as a bird watcher, as somebody who I, I used to walk around my house and monitor the birds, it gave me some additional purpose. It was wonderful to be able to have uh, to have this information go into some broader database that would have broader consequences than just me finding out and monitoring what's there on my house. Or uh, so I think uh, that's one of the reasons why eBird has grown so much here because India has had a long history of bird watching and ornithology and there have been so many bird watchers and suddenly there was this possibility of everything having greater purpose uh, so it, it took off really fast and um, in uh, bird count india through the 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 role of bird count india was to basically uh, let people know that uh, they could monitor birds using this platform uh, we tried to um, we had workshops in some parts of the country and uh, through that the the this possibility has become uh, known to many people around the country and inevitably there's been uh, greater usage and all of this actually has come to fruition now um, in the last year where it was a bit of an abstract concept again that uh, this was going to be something more than all of us just watching birds but we managed to use eBird data exclusively to produce our first ever national assessment of birds in India and uh, several institutions, organizations came together, saw this opportunity and came out with this assessment. And uh, while the results of the assessment are not very encouraging, the fact that this assessment could be made is a great uh, success, I think. Yeah, I read that. That was a phenomenal. Yeah, I, I remember that. Um, so Ashwin, what were the findings, surprising or not, of eBird with respect to avian populations in India and Chris with the world? Okay, so um, I'll go first. Uh, like um, other studies in other parts of the world, we found that raptors have been particularly badly hit. Um, open area raptors in particular have uh, declined considerably. So this was not a surprising uh, finding. Um, we've also found that showbird populations, especially Arctic breeding showbirds, uh, have declined considerably. And this is um, actually an addition in my understanding to global knowledge, because many of the populations that winter in India are from a region uh, that's not very well, mo well monitored during the breeding times. Um, I think uh, remote parts of, um, of Russia and thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, some of the surprising findings uh, have been encouraging. Uh, House Sparrow, for example. Uh, House Sparrow, we all thought it was declining. There was a huge... Uh, outpouring of uh, lament for the house sparrow across the country, I think across the world, actually, in many places. And in India, there are various theories that uh, people spoke about. But we found that the data uh, is quite um, confident in that house sparrows have been stable over the last 25 years or so. Um, and uh, Indian peafowl, our national bird, has increased dramatically. Uh, not so much of a surprise because we've all suspected it, but now the data says that it's uh, um, it's increased by about 100% in the country as a whole. And to go back to something Chris said, how is it that we're able to do these, make these assessments um, with data that is 25 years old when uh, eBird was eBird started being used only in 2014? Uh, bird watchers in India have also maintained notebooks. They have there are hundreds of bird watchers with trunks and trunks of notebooks where they have this incredible information of what's happened in the past. Uh, so many of them have been um, generous enough to upload that information, allowing us to uh, make these assessments. Great. And Chris? 
Yeah, and this, I mean, this is something where I think India has really been at the forefront in terms of thinking about how to use eBird for trends. And we're actually not quite as far ahead on that. We are um, just now getting to the point where we're, we're, uh, we're understanding enough about sort of um, some of the ways that people are going birding, how that may change over time, um, and, and disentangling so when people use eBird, I'm, I'm going to take a couple steps back and explain one of the challenges that we have. Because when people go birding, there's two things that, that take place that influence what people are seeing. One is sort of what birds are actually there on the ground. And the other is how people are going about and looking for birds. So if you go out and you spend five minutes standing in one place, you're going to see a lot fewer birds than if you walk around for an hour or two. And so understanding just how that effort relates to um, detection of birds has been one of the, the core areas that we've been focused on. And then trying to develop um, basically maps for where birds are every single week of the year. So we're trying to understand, make sure that we have a high degree of confidence that we're predicting where birds are today to make sure that the methods of analysis are are consistent with what some of the other long-term data sets in the U.S. Have, are showing. So we compare it to things like the Breeding Bird Survey, which for so long in the U.S. has really, you know, since the 1960s, has, has been sort of a cornerstone of more systematic monitoring efforts. And with eBird, people are going where they want to go. They're going where they think they're going to see birds. So the analysis team has a lot more um, work to do to try to control the bias between sort of how bird watchers are bird watching and and what and what they're seeing and this is what's so exciting is you know there's a there's a, a role that i think um india has played in terms of some of the mechanisms that they've done to encourage people to enter their old data um some of the ways that they've been approaching analysis that i think we're learning from which is um which i think is just really exciting and and speaks to the core of of what we're hoping to do with this global effort uh, but avian populations, uh, Chris, for example, in India, we always compare with China and we talk about how China is doing environmentally versus us. So um, any broad strokes and uh, Chinese birds declined and then went up or even if you want to speak in that level of uh, or uh, in Latin America, this particular species went up and down. Any broad strokes you can offer? Yeah, I. I think you know the, the research team is really focused on coming up with a publication probably this fall on the a comp sort of an assessment of birds in North America. And I don't think it would be fair for me to sort of talk about some of the things that I've seen from that report ahead of time. But yeah. what I will say is that is that things are very complicated and that um, there are some general patterns that you can see. And so some of the general patterns are are birds that like colder areas, birds that are sort of at, at the tops of mountains, birds that are found at northern latitudes. In general, overall, a consistent pattern is that birds are moving up in elevation as the, as the climate warms, you're basically seeing this pattern. But there are also some very interesting counterexamples to that. And a lot of that has to do with sort of habitat. So there's this interplay that happens between climate and habitat. And because in, in the U.S., a lot of the forests were cut in the eastern part of the U.S., what's, what's happened is there's also birds that are moving back into areas that had basically been, been cut and, and they were put into sort of small scale farms. Those small scale farms are really not competitive in, in sort of an international market. There's definitely a switch towards you know, more locally sourced foods. And so there may be a, a different trend in the future. But at least right now, um, a lot of those areas have reverted to big patches of forest. So there's other things like yellow-bellied sapsucker, um, which is the symbol for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And, and the reason for that is because the very first sapsucker was found at, at this place called Sapsucker Woods. There's sort of this tradition in bird watching to sort of give a little patch of woods the name of some cool, interesting bird that was found there if it doesn't really have a name. And then that way, all the people in the birding community know like, oh, this is Sapsucker Woods. Oh, this is the Golden Winged Warbler Grove. Hmm. Um, and so with Sapsucker, that was, that was sort of the first of what's become a, a pretty consistent pattern of yellow-bellied sapsuckers sort of expanding to the south. And we're at this really interesting point now 
where there's a lot of interesting questions that we can start asking ourselves about sort of why are there certain species that seem to be um, apart from the overall all pattern? And so in general, a lot of neotropical migrants, birds that are doing long distance migrations in the Americas, their populations are declining. One group that's different from that, and these are based on really focused studies um, with the breeding bird, sur breeding bird survey. So these are not data that have been done from eBird. I wanna, I wanna be really clear about that, um, but in this, Vireos are sort of this counter example to that. Vireo populations are going up. So it raises all these interesting questions about is it diet related? Is there something, you know, what, what causes that? And I think in many ways, you know, eBird is a great hypothesis generation tool. So you, you can start to see patterns now. You can see the movement of birds and it it forces sort of the very basic thing that, that science is all about. You start getting questions and then trying to come up with ways to explore those. Mm. Ashwin, do you want to add anything to what Chris was saying? Yeah, so some of our um, analysis has again uh, provided us with a lot of questions. Uh, there have been species movements, there have been expansions, and we don't really know why uh, that really has to be explored. For example, even uh, 30 years back, the entire state of Kerala had uh, almost uh, had very few regions with uh, peafowl. I think there were two out of um, a number of districts where the species had been recorded. But now Indian peafowl has moved uh, across the entire state. They are found everywhere in the state and they are found everywhere, even in, the, even in parts of the Western Ghats now. And uh, this is actually something we're able to document uh, uh, both through independent studies and through uh, eBird data itself. Uh, but the question is why? Uh, we don't really know why. Why are peafowl expanding the way they are? Is it that places are drying a little more? Is it some source of food that has opened up for them? Is it that there are no predators? We don't really know the answer. There are many, there are many uh, range shifts at the moment that um, we're not able to explain fully. So we're hoping that uh, people are going to look at the data, look at these results and start asking questions in India about why these are happening. And uh, about um, elevational shifts, uh, there's some exciting research happening in the Indian Himalayas as well. Uh, it's a combination of uh, data, both from eBird and uh, uh, tagging and ringing studies following uh, bird demographics across elevational ranges. And we should have some of those, uh, um, some of those research outputs coming out soon. So uh, some exciting times ahead for Indian ornithology, I feel. Yeah. So both of you, your organizations have reports coming out. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, Chris, my next question was going to be, um, what has eBird revealed about migratory patterns globally and also to ask Ashwin about India? But I was really fascinated by your answer. So, uh, so I want to ask, what, has, what have been some surprising findings that eBird has come across? Never mind migratory or <laughs> anything else. Because you yeah, guys I think, keep it differently. I think, you know, it, it um I think it depends at the the sort of level of of passion that you have for sort of the intricacies of, of bird movements. Mm -hmm. And so for some of us that are really steeped in study of bird migration, some of the things that are surprising, you know, all the one of the first things that we ever had, I think, because it was the first time that we saw a pattern that was so distinct, was um, in a couple different species in terms of their migration and arrival dates, Eastern Phoebe and um, an Orchard Oriole. And we could really see that those are birds that are that are in both cases mostly birds in the eastern part of the U.S. and Canada. Eastern Phoebe reaching a little bit farther north, and then they move south. Eastern Phoebe mostly, you know, still in in the U.S. and Orchard Oriole going, you know, south into Guatemala, Central America, and and both of those had these different patterns in terms of when the birds are arriving. And and in the case of Orchard Oriole, you know, if you go through and read a hundred different monograph, a hundred different sort of state um, journals, you can see that this was sort of described, but when you actually have the ability to visualize sort of the movement every week of the year, all of a sudden there's this aha moment, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. And and here there's sort of 52 pictures. And and so you're, you're just getting 
these unprecedented views into bird migration and, and starting to see that there's these different patterns. And that raises all these really interesting questions. You know, if birds, if this one population is um, arriving a month later than another population, they're basically not going to be breeding at the same time. And you're going to start to have um, different populations, maybe subspecies sort of starting to, starting to form. And you're starting to see sort of some of these um, theories that have been scientific theories for a long time, really starting to see sort of these things playing out in a, in a way that, you know, I don't think we'd really had the ability to see it sort of such broad spatial scale. So, so for me that I'll never forget the sort of first time that I saw research that Daniel Fink was doing on, on Eastern Phoebe and the profound differences in sort of arrival patterns of, of that. And it was this aha moment. And now there's several more kind of examples that are similar to that. But, you know, the first time you see something new is always the one that I think s sticks there for you. Mm -hmm. At least for uh, Ashwin, what about India? Any unusual, what, any surprising findings? So migratory. We, we actually knew uh, we didn't know too much about migration in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, based on um, observations and collections in the past, uh, field guides had certain maps where you expect the species to be winter visitors or present year round in certain areas. But um, eBird data now has thrown all of that off a little bit. For example, um, so that's uh, something that, so in BirdCount India, we've been making these migration maps uh, using global eBird data. And uh, recently uh, we made a migration, made a map for black cap kingfisher. And uh, field guides are a bit uh, equivocal in that uh, some, um, some field guides have them as winter visitors to some parts of the country, some parts of the coast. Uh, some other field guides have them as resident along the coastline. But if you look at uh, eBird data, these snapshots of where the species is reported during different parts of the year, you see that uh, black cap kingfisher is entirely a migrant to the Indian subcontinent. It's extremely common in some parts of our coastline during the winter. But then we started asking bird watchers, have you, are they resident? They would say, maybe, yes. Uh, have you ever seen them in the summer or monsoon? They couldn't remember. Some of them would say no, but you look at the data, it's only in the winter. And you see this amazing movement between uh, Northeast Asia and uh, birds potentially moving into the Indian subcontinent. And uh, so some really interesting patterns of that sort. Another thing that, uh, that we became aware of when these maps started being produced is that India is the uh, global custodian of so many species that uh, so many species that breed Eurasian temperate regions and uh, Eurasian taiga, and they all funnel into the subcontinent uh, during the winter. And it's quite remarkable. Uh, the entire global population of blight reed warbler, um, some uh, common rose finch uh, and uh, greenish warbler, certain subspecies, and uh, bar-headed goose. There are so many species that uh, almost the entire global population is in the Indian subcontinent during winter. So. Uh, that was that was quite surprising mm -hmm. for some of us. Uh, we didn't have that perspective just yet, and we have it now because mm -hmm. of a global repository. Mm -hmm. Which are similarly enthusiastic countries which provide data to you, Chris? Is it uh, the Americas? I mean, I would imagine South America would be providing you a bunch of data. And uh, which are some of the top countries where you source this data from? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really good question, and and I think Ashwin earlier um, hit on a good point in in that where we've had the most success initially is where um, birding communities already existed, and there was a tradition of looking at birds, um, and so those are those are places you know like India, like Australia, um, Mexico certainly because it was early Canada, obviously the U.S. Um, quite a bit of Europe. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that has really been probably the most exciting is the way that, that I think eBird and, and then a, a, a product that sort of came as a result of, of eBird called Merlin has really been able to start to also sort of build and increase the number of people that are connected into birds. And so with Merlin, what we can do is one of the hardest things about identifying birds is um, 
knowing what is possible at, at, at any place in the world at different times of the year. And the reason that when you go out with Ashwin and, and he can identify everything immediately, just as it flies by in part is because he has a, he's very keenly tuned into probability of sort of what's there. So he's not thinking about all the kingfishers around the world and carefully eliminating sort of the differences in those, but there's a bit of probability in there. And so the idea now that we have this, this global database is to be able to use some of the information in terms of the probability of finding different birds at different places that, that really comes from the audience that's looking for birds. Um, and then being able to say, okay, let's filter that down. So instead of all the birds that have been seen in India, you know, you're, you're able to take a thousand birds and then zoom into, um, you know, maybe 200 species of birds at a, at a particular place on that, on that date. And that's a, that's a very, I mean, it's almost magic, right? Merlin, a magician. And then there's a series of questions that you can answer that says like, was the bird flying? Was it in the field? How big was it? And you start filtering it down and it's, it's a very different process than necessarily paging through a field guide. Um, so some, some people that have been involved in birding for a long time, like me, I'm a little like, I don't know, this is different from the way that I learned. If it's different, it may not be good because it's different and it, I'm not certain the implications. But you know, when, when you, you combine that and then people also use field guides, you start to see some pretty some pretty cool things, and then you know there's we're also at this really interesting point where computer vision has really taken off, and so with computer vision, um, you can now take a picture of a bird, and you know if the Macaulay Library has you know a hundred images of that, we start to be able to classify those with a surprising degree of accuracy. So you can upload it upload images and we're starting to see you know reports of birds in places that we didn't think they occurred that come in with photographs now and you say no 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 that's not that's not possible and then oh well here's a, here's a photograph of it so the what that's allowed is is even places um and and countries where people do not they're they don't have the same opportunities that you know some people growing up in more affluent parts of india or the u.s may have um, they're still starting to get engaged with birds because a lot of people um, do have a cell phone and, you know, they can download, you know, Merlin's free and it can, it can sort of stimulate sort of some interest and you start going around. And so part of, part of what we've been thinking about is, you know, are, is there a role that eBird can, can play in terms of thinking about sustainable development and connecting um, you know, this large number of people that are coming to eBird. So, you know, last year, I think, I think we had about 8 million people come to the eBird site. Can we connect those with, you know, small local, um, local groups that are leading bird walks? And so one of the really cool examples of this that, that I can think of is, is there's, um, there's some groups in Mexico um, and this is this is work that Umberto Berlanga and that team at Canavio, you know, the visionaries that had this idea of expanding eBird globally, they've been working with a lot of individual communities to allow eBird to be a way of of monitoring forest health. So the idea is that that there's a suite of birds that can be good proxies for the type of management that communities are doing, and there could be incentives that are given to those communities to you know produce a um, and sustain sustain certain types of forest and that that relates to sort of climate change if you're able to maintain large trees um, you're going to have higher biodiversity but you're also a carbon you know it's a way of sequestering carbon so there's as that was happening and, and these and groups were just monitoring for the sake of sort of you know monitoring their woods what what happened is they were finding some really interesting birds um, and this group called the Mayan Jays, there's sort of, it's a sort of community in the Yucatan, started, you know, they're posting their records into eBird so that, that they could have access to them. And then bird watchers started seeing that and writing to them and saying, um, we'd like to come down and see some of these birds that are really special that are hard to find in other places. And so it's been a way of connecting um, people that are interested in seeing birds, people with, with people in pretty small, um, remote communities that haven't had ha, haven't benefited 
um, from tourism. Obviously, there's a lot of implications in terms of how we think about that. Um, but because of that, I think there's a lot of, of places where eBird growth has been disproportionate to where you would think it would be based on sort of income and other things that are that are correlated with you, you know free time that you can spend looking at birds you know those are all privileges that many many of us are fortunate enough to have but those are not evenly distributed certainly around the world and and in these places you know in in guatemala there's some really great examples honduras there's some great examples um we've really seen ebird taking off at a, at a disproportionate rate and the, the one other thing that I would say that, that connects to this is um, there's some really cool things happening right now in Colombia. And, and part of that was related to this effort that we have called Global, Global Big Day. In India, it's called Endemic, um, Endemic Bird Day. But the effort um, on Global Big Day, which is in, in May, um, is basically to you know have people all around the world enter the birds into eBird in, in, on one day, because Colombia is so rich in terms of its bird diversity. You know, there's almost 2,000 species that have been seen in Colombia. Um, it's it's been this source of pride to participate, and part of it's a little bit of you know of a game. They're able to show that they've seen more birds than any other country in the world. And everybody likes bragging rights. It's sort of like yeah. the, the World Cup, right? Or, or maybe cricket. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know exactly what the, the, the major thing in cricket is. But, you know, there's, there's a little bit of fun sort of camaraderie and, and sports that, that sort of ties into it and sort of national pride. And it's been exciting to see that take place in Colombia. And there's, this is happening at a time when, when, for the first time, people are able to travel in Colombia with, without the types of worries that had been that they would be kidnapped. That, And as part of this peace process and reconciliation, there's several people in Colombia that are really thinking about the way that birds um, can bring people together as part of the peace process. And, you know, one of the people that I've been really fortunate to, to work with, Diego Calderon, has really been at, at the forefront of sort of thinking about how you brought people together that, you know, for almost a hundred years were, were fighting in various ways. And these are, um, I feel like the world is at, a, is at a place right now where so many of our countries, there's profound conflict. Um, and lack of trust and understanding. And birds are this little beacon of hope where sometimes for a short period of time, people that think very differently on just about everything else, you know, can come together and there is an opportunity if we choose to take it, um, to listen to each other and, and learn from diverse perspectives. So um, wow. that was a very long answer to what, what was probably a simple, question of, of where eBird is, is taken off, but there's a lot of complexity in there. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, 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 Ashwin, uh, this links to the question that Chris said I, he didn't understand when I, uh, I wrote to you earlier. I'd love your view on uh, alluding to what Chris said. What I was really asking is, and you will know this, Ashwin, there are Sholiga tribals in remote parts of India, and I don't know if they are on eBird, how are and they know a lot about birds so how are we going to and this when he talked about the yucatan peninsula and the mayan jays it's sort of that's exactly what i was asking is how are you going to get rare to find not even species but rare hard to find people to contribute to this database because they can and they should yes so uh, i'll go back to some of the things that chris spoke about uh, that was fantastic to listen to um Merlin is uh, increasingly playing a really important role in bringing birds to many communities that perhaps uh, haven't had the exposure or the privilege of being exposed to birds in the past. Uh, and uh, unlike eBird, which is uh, which is something which is, I think, a next step, you would want to experience and enjoy birds first. And Merlin is able to do that uh, in many places uh, that are a little remote that haven't had access. There's been no way for people to have such high quality photographs at their disposal for every species, high quality uh, call recordings. And uh, in uh, in many parts where we uh, where we go and uh, we meet bird watchers, local bird watchers speak about birds. We see that Merlin 
immediately um, resonates with them. Uh, they immediately download it, uh, play back the calls, and say, "Oh my God, this is the same. This is what we're hearing in front of us." And there's no opportunity to do that in the past. You look at the photo, you play the call, and you have this connection with birds right there. And uh, in many parts of, uh, say, even Northeast India now, uh, Merlin has taken off. There are many uh, budding bird watchers. who have been exploring this app and uh, eventually that's going to lead to a greater um, i think to perhaps monitoring birds around them uh, while i don't think uh, there are many remote parts of the country where birding uh, still i uh, still is a long way away uh, but uh, there are many remote parts of the country where birding has taken off and e-birding has taken off in a very similar manner to um, to the regions which chris mentioned uh, there are parts of nagaland now remote parts of nagaland where there are local um, peop- local bird watchers uh, monitoring birds and recording things that we had no idea were actually present in these areas uh, recording all of these with uh, with with excellent evidence uh, parts of uh, sikkim arunachal pradesh areas where there was very little information about what actually was there and uh, all of this has led to yeah. people again contacting uh, bird watchers there asking them can we visit can we come and watch these birds and uh, the story has been very similar uh, and uh, birding now in northeast india bir- birding and e-birding has be- become a source of um, income and livelihood as well uh and then um and this is uh, continuously increasing there are people from elsewhere in the country who want to go there all the time and ebird is a great way to showcase what's present in an area and uh, many bird watchers have uh, picked that up and um, i think um, that's what we are seeing now uh very soon i think there's going to be representation from many remote parts of the country because uh, again birding is is something that people find so enjoyable once they introduced to it and especially if uh, if children youngsters uh, get interested then um i think people pick it up very soon chris uh chris my next question is a particular passion of mine um it is a uh, it is how do you marry specificity and local context with standardization and global access is the broad question by which i mean there's got to be a mexi uh, spanish name for the yucatan jays that you talk about there's got to be folklore around it there's got to be vernacular names and in the standardization and the lingua franca of english certainly in india where every state has a different name for the bird because we have so many languages my my fear is we are losing all that indigenous knowledge and if anybody can i think ebird can actually allow that knowledge can to I, circulate up to the top is that something can i step in here for a second okay, uh, because please. today is uh, actually yeah, a landmark yeah. day in that we have got uh, all all bird names uh, live in marathi um yeah on birds of the world on ebird and uh, this follows all of all of these names already being live in malayalam it's it's wonderful to see the discussions that people have whenever a new bird is recorded in kerala something that's never been seen before in the state there are these fantastic conversations that go on on what to name these birds and it immediately becomes the um, name for that species on ebird as well so ebird uh, there are many vernacular languages that uh, ebirds on and i'm sure chris can say more across the world but in india we are working towards having uh, to re- retaining all of this local knowledge uh, and having Uh, and it's really important that people be able to uh, record birds in the language they're comfortable with on this platform yeah yeah and chris do you have anything to add yeah i mean i i think this is a this is a profoundly important question and and something that i think we we try our best to to support um i think right now there's there's 42 different names different languages that ebird supports um and i think in terms of bird names i think it's something like we're up to 68 different choices and part of the part of the complexity around this is 
is there's two different things that we want to do. We want to preserve local knowledge. We want to preserve local culture. And, and also even the um, language has a way of, of sort of communicating things that, that is literally lost in translation. There's a connection to a place. There's a way of thinking, even, even the way that, that thoughts are formed when, you're, when, you're, when put into words can be very, very different. And it's a, it's a real challenge. You know, I speak some Spanish and I, and I find that there's certain things that are just easier for me to actually process and think about in Spanish because of the way that the language is structured than in English. And, and when you think about that globally, what that means and what we have the potential to lose um, you know, that's a, that's a profound loss that we do, we do not want to lose. On the other hand, we're also trying to create a global, a global community where people can communicate together. And so the idea is that scientific names would form the basis from which, you know, we can communicate. The challenge with scientific names is that there's, they're also the purpose for scientific names is also to explain evolutionary relationships. And so as we understand sort of where birds fall, scientific names can change very, very frequently. So they can be hard to use um, for non-scientists because they're changing so frequently. And so there's a, um, a, a rose by any other name may, may swell, smell as sweet, right? And we need to try to balance these things. And I think what's so helpful um, for us is that we have people like, like Ashwin and like you that are raising these issues and helping us think, think through them um, because they're, they're difficult. You know, if, if these were easy things to solve, um, we'd have them solved. And I think that's honestly, for me, part of, part of the fun in the project is sort of trying to figure out how we can do these things of bringing people together and increasing communication while also maintaining all of the the incredible diversity that we have and i mean we we know that as scientists diverse systems are inherently more stable um and when you start losing those pieces um there's you lose things and i think we want to find the right balance when it comes you know to people around the world as well um chris how does ebird help conservation because that's something you talk about and ashwin how does it help conservation here in india chris you want to go first sure i can i can go first i mean i think this is right at the point where we're really starting to 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 get most of our excitement right now because there there are getting to be more and more examples of this and and part of it is just understanding where birds are at any you know any day of the year so we've moved beyond sort of a field guide representation that that sort of paints these these firm lines and able to start looking at abundance um, and relative abundance to, to identify the areas that, that might be most critical for species. Um, and there's, there's so many sort of specific examples. I'll, I'll, I'll name one that, that's a little longer to go into, but it's because I think it speaks to sort of the innovation that's happening in, in conservation. And so um, the Nature Conservancy in California, I, uh, you know, the Nature Conservancy's one of the the primary things that they're famous for certainly historically is buying land and conserving that land in perpetuity but if i were to um come to india and visit you which i hoped i hope to do one day soon um i wouldn't buy a house i would rent and and for a lot of migratory birds we're starting to think and and this is the nature conservancy idea are there ways that we could think about renting for, for times when birds are moving through. So they had this idea that, you know, shorebirds move through the Central Valley of California. The Central Valley of California is also probably the most um, industrial agricultural system in the world. Um, every acre is, is put into use. There are some national wildlife refuges and other protected areas there, 
but it's not practical to sort of think about buying large portions of, of what is really, you know, critically important for sustaining human populations in the US to, to, to sort of protect this. So the idea was, you know, let's look at that system and think, are there certain systems that might be um, able to, to have multiple uses? And rice was a very logical one because of the way that, what, that rice production takes place. There's periods where you flood those fields and how long you choose to keep the water on the field, um, you, can, you can change that. And you, because the infrastructure already exists to flood those fields, you could try to change that timing in a way that's optimized both for food production, but also shorebird habitat. So what the, the Nature Conservancy did is they used some of the, the models that the scientists at the lab developed that tell us exactly when shorebirds and ducks are moving through the Central Valley. And they linked it with data that Point Blue, a conservation group based in, in Point Reyes in California has, that shows you know, exactly where the water typically is on the landscape to identify these gaps. And then they approached rice farmers and said, okay, you know, these are high priority areas. These are extremely high priority areas. And these are sort of medium or low priority areas. How much would we need to pay you to keep water on the landscape a little bit later or, or put water on a little bit, um, a little bit earlier? And basically used a reverse auction where, where people would say, well, you can pay me 20. Somebody else would say, well, you'll need to pay me $30. But this is an area where based on the, the models, we thought that there would be sort of 10 times the number of birds if you put habitat there. So using the best scientific data, <clears throat> excuse me, the Nature Conservancy went through with these, this project and it resulted in some of the largest concentrations of shorebirds that have ever been recorded you know, in the Central Valley of California in some of these places. So to me, that's, that's a really interesting example of thinking about how we can use high quality data, all contributed by bird watchers, um, to really start affecting conservation in, in a really innovative and new way. Yeah, that's, that's a, what yeah, a great yeah. idea, right, Ashwin? For our, uh, a fantastic idea, and, um, and and hopefully we'll be able to apply some of this knowledge in similar non-traditional ways. Uh, in India so far, we've uh, we've mm -hmm. had uh, eBirds helped in uh, more traditional forms of conservation. Uh, in that uh, there've been um, there've been areas uh, you might have heard of some of them, uh, Basai wetlands in uh, near Haryana and Delhi. Uh, the Dibang Valley in uh, northeastern Arunachal um, and a few other places around the country where eBird data has helped produce knowledge that has uh, helped support the fact that a place must be conserved or preserved. In that, uh, in uh, in court, in uh, legal battles, um, eBird data has played an important role in 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 um, being able to say that yes, this area is worth conserving. So that is uh, so eBird has this data has already been helping in this more traditional form of uh, conservation here, but I think one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest roles um, at the moment of uh, eBird data helping with conservation is uh, is something uh, far uh, more basic in that it it's helping bring birds to people, helping bring birds to uh, to local governmental organizations. A good example is in Kerala. Where every panchayat now has uh, has information from eBird about what is present there, what is present in the area, and uh, they can use that for local policy decisions. And we hope that uh, something of this sort is going to uh, be going to happen across many more parts of the country, where local policy, local uh, governmental bodies will have information to make uh, decisions that matter. Uh, we've also had some really heartwarming instances of. Uh, of roads now being named after birds. There's one in Kerala in Kasargod, where um, orange breasted green pigeon, uh, a species called orange breasted green pigeon, became such a phenomenon locally because um, birders were reporting it regularly. People were coming from other places to see it. School kids were talking about it. That it was actually made into uh, a road was named after that species over there. So we have a, an official road name that is Orange Breasted Green Pigeon Road that was only possible because of this democratization of that information through eBird, in a sense. And uh, that's happening all over the country, where everybody is able to access this information. And I think it has great benefits. 
So we're coming to the tail end. Um, I have three questions, and I'll put them to both of you. How do you uh, choose reviewers, Chris? Um, how do you ensure that the data is robust for both of you? And what do you guys do for fun when you're not thinking about eBird? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that the reviewers, you know, we have a very decentralized model. So what I would say is I would turn that over to Ashwin because he is part of the team who decides how to select reviewers because I don't think that sort of a, a one policy works everywhere around the world. But at a very high level, I can say what we look for is, is we try to find people that are using eBird and understand how the system works. We try to find people who have a a high level of knowledge of bird status and distribution and identification. And we try to look for people who are good people people. They can interact well. Um, their desires are the same in terms of inclusivity, in terms of wanting to expand the number of people that, that we're working with. And so those are sort of the goals of what we're thinking about it at, at sort of when we're, when we're looking to expand the, the sort of team of partners that we're working with globally. Okay. Uh, so um, it's a similar model that we follow. It's actually quite decentralized even in India, where we try and uh, there are leaders, birdwatching leaders in states, in a sense, and uh, a lot of the deci decision making we leave to them. And the broader, uh, the broader things that we look for are what Chris mentioned. One of the most important things, I think, for a reviewer is uh, a deep understanding of the system. So we look for people who are already comfortable with eBird, who are um, happy to contribute uh, information on birds and understand how it works, understand how it is to be a, a, a birder, an eBirder. Uh, we also, again, look for people who, um, who have time to volunteer. It's something we found is really important because eventually this is a, uh, this is a, a position where people need to volunteer their time. And there are many people who are just too busy to be able to give that time. So we think that, uh, yeah, that's an important aspect. And again, uh, we don't often suggest, we don't always find reviewers ourselves. There are birders who write to us who are really interested in, uh, they end, and uh, they end up being wonderful reviewers and uh, give so much time and energy to the project. So it's, yeah, there's no single answer. And uh, why don't you take the next one, Ashwin? How do you man maintain uh, robust data? How do you ensure robust data? Uh, so uh, eBird has a number of uh, data quality uh, filters in a sense. Uh, so I'll explain how that works. There's first, when people are making a checklist, they see a list of species uh, which they're able to, which they view on the app. And uh, this is determined by a pre-existing filter, a list of species for that region. So what you'll what a bird watcher will see in Bangalore is going to be different from what they see in Delhi. Uh, also, yep. there are a number of uh, birds yes. on this filter that will show up as rare, which is determined by the filter. So this is a first step to encouraging people to document what they're seeing, uh, to write down field notes to say, yes. uh, okay, I saw this uh, color on the wings and the bill was shaped in this manner, and therefore I used the field guide and decided it was this species or um, evidence in the form of photographs, in the form of uh, audio. And this is not because uh, bird watchers, there's an inherent uh, culture of suspicion. It's so that 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line, when nobody knows who any of us are, this data still stands and uh, it still remains authentic. And somebody can look at it and say, okay, this has been well documented and therefore I can believe it 100 years down the line. So that is the culture we try and uh, inculcate. Uh, beyond that, something that is flagged by the filter, uh, something where people are provided notes that is read, goes into a review queue. And that is where reviewers come in. And reviewers um, look at that information, see whether it's well documented, have a back and forth with the birder, uh, say that, can you provide more information? Or is there something more uh, that you saw? Uh, and that um, there's the back and forth. And then the observation is uh, confirmed or unconfirmed based on the amount of uh, evidence there is. Now, a third, uh, there's a third level, which I think is works extremely strongly now, uh, which is uh, that bird watchers, the entire community of bird watchers in the country, entire community of bird watchers in the world are overseeing the quality of information. 
uh, where there's a system where bird watchers can uh, flag photos that are wrongly identified. But also we have so many communication channels now around India, WhatsApp groups, Facebook, etc., where anybody can come and say, okay, uh, so I think this one requires more evidence or this observation, uh, there might be some mistake here. And because of that, it's uh, the, um, because these three um, steps, in a sense, uh, the, I think the data remains of, of uh, incredibly high quality. Of course, um, they, they con- continuous developments where the filters are being modified. Uh, we are learning more and more things about birds. We uh, until recently thought that Eastern yellow wagtail was hypothetical to India. We didn't even know that it was present in most of the country. But now we're finding that Eastern yellow wagtail is present through a large part of the country. Now, what does that mean for all the Western yellow wagtail records in the past? That needs to be, uh, need to revise all of that, uh, talk to bird watchers, look at photos in the past. And as a community, we learn and the database learns in the process. So. Chris, can you add to this or is that pretty much how it is globally as well? No, I mean, I think that's exactly what it, what it is globally. Um, I, I really don't have t- too much to add to it other than there are some additional steps that we take in terms of, of some of the, the, the most sophisticated data modeling that we do. And that has to do with sort of controlling for the factors about, about effort and things like that. So, um, and we also know that, that there's, as people go bird watching longer and longer, they learn more. And they, they can find birds in, in less amount of time. They learn calls, they learn songs. You know, so much of how you find and detect birds in forest is auditory. So it takes some time to learn those. And so the, the, the biggest challenge that we have is not so much birds that um, people report that aren't there, but birds that are there that people just don't detect because they, they don't have the experience. And so there's a lot of science that that's looking at sort of differences among observers to say that, well, this person generally, you know, based on the data we have, it takes them longer to find these birds than, than it does with Ashwin. So if I were to come to India, you know, I, it would take me a lot longer to identify the birds, um, to find the birds, you know, I'd hear it, but I'd have to track everything down at the beginning because I don't know the song. Whereas, you know, if you were to come to the U.S. and be with me, I, I'd be pretty good. Like I, I could identify all the calls and all the songs and, and, and there I would be good. And so understanding just sort of these real ways that people learn about birds is part of the, the process. And what's cool and, and so exciting for me is we've shown that even having the beginner bird watcher data in there is, is valuable and it increases the value of the models than if we didn't include those. And so we get information on birds like bald eagle, which is a very, it's a common bird and they, well, it's, it's becoming an increasing, increasing bird. It used to be an endangered species, um, but it's very detectable because, you know, they're big, they have a white head, they fly around. And so anyone, if, if there's an eagle around and, and looking, will find one. So it's a, it's a fascinating, question about data quality and we yeah. continue to learn from Even each the, other. the state of yeah. birds analysis, there were many uh, filtering steps that had to be done. And that's inevitable in, in, a, in a semi-structured database of this sort, in that uh, we had to use only complete checklists, yeah. which are uh, checklists where all species have been reported. Uh, anything that was more than about 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, we excluded uh, in terms of distance. Uh, there are some checklists where people report only one or two species, but it's over four or five hours. And all of these, all of these are anomalies in the data, and these can be excluded uh, post the data being produced. Uh, in response to Chris, uh, Chris's uh, point about uh, different experiences resulting in different probabilities of detection, uh, we found uh, we found that list length or the number of species reported in a checklist is a great way to actually predict um, how likely it is to. Uh, for a species to be reported and um, we i mean I, i'm sure there's further analysis that is required to see how important how well this uh, explains the probability of a bird being reported in a checklist but um, it's a it's a step that allowed us to come to slightly more confident conclusions in the state of birds analysis and this was only possible because of uh, the kerala bird atlas Something I haven't mentioned here, which was a uh, which was an incredible effort by the bird watchers of Kerala of the systematic sampling of the entire state, which is a huge area. 
that has allowed us, that has given us a data set to actually calibrate any of this, any analysis with uh, the broader eBird data. And uh, at some point, we we'll, uh, can have a discussion about the details of that. Yeah. As for my last question about whether eBird helps them with the birding, I realized that it was a redundant question to ask two prolific and proficient eBirders. Both Chris and Ashwin said the same thing, that using eBird helped them focus and appreciate nature. But there was one thing that I wanted Chris to return to. He had alluded to how eBird teases apart data based on whether bird watchers were moving around or were stationary in one place. I asked him to explain that a little bit, and this is what he said. Of where they went and the reason that we record that effort information, like when you started and when you ended and why that's so important, is it allows us to tease apart the, the behavior of the sensor so a bird watcher, we, you know, you could think of eBird as just a great big sensor network. Like if you put a bunch of thermometers all around the world, there's going to be bias with each of those sensors. With people, the bias is potentially greater. So we need to, to really think about how we calibrate that sensor network. And this is a way that we calibrate that by recording more information and then sort of comparing different sensors, different bird watchers with each other. Not to say that, you know, my mom is a, is a bad sensor, but what it is, is, you know, when it comes to species like goldfinches and chickadees that are coming to her feeder, her, she's just as good as sort of the best person. But if there's some hard to detect bird that's flying over, she may not detect that. And so being able to understand those differences, being able to understand, you know, that she was, you know, walking around the garden as opposed to, you know, traveling for three miles. That's what I was trying to, to get at it. I probably didn't do a very good job explaining. Oh, but he did. So we ended up having a nice chat afterwards and said our thank yous to each other. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.